I hope everyone is doing okay. Uh, in case you were not aware, the world is, is as insane as ever. Events proceed in their disturbing way. Um, so, uh, we do have this refuge, you know, and uh, I think maybe for a minute I'll talk about refuge and, and a little bit in the context of what we're doing. Just, just to say that, you know, the traditional Buddhist idea is that when we sort of uh, become, I guess we could say converted, but that's not quite the right word to Buddhism when we really feel drawn to Buddhism, we, we take refuge in the Buddha as a teacher, but also as a as an archetype and as a as a kind of model for awakening that we seek to emulate. And we take refuge in the Dharma, which is the teachings. So we try to live in harmony with those teachings and remember them, kind of keep them uppermost in our mind. Uh, and then we take refuge in the Sangha, which is the community. So we're all here doing that right now. But I think of our, our meditation as a kind of refuge, uh, which is what made me think of it, that, that when we can turn, turn inside and connect with our selves, when we can bring some inner calm and inner peace and clarity to ourselves, it's a refuge from the madness of the world. And, um, and that makes it very precious and, and something that, you know, we turn to. I certainly turn to that every day. Um, and at, at least during that time of meditation, try to try to both be in that space of being of we could say equanimity and being undisturbed by the outer world but also remember that the uh this outer world and that is is one which is must be in turmoil because it's driven by the forces of greed, hatred, and delusion, and and that it's all impermanent, and uh, and so not to become too um, attached to it, you know. And so meditating helps me to to kind of release some of that attachment, and thus and thus becomes in both. It, it, it becomes refuge in and of itself. It, it embodies refuge. So with that, let's, let's begin to sit. I'm just um, settling into your meditation posture. You can close your eyes or just lower your gaze. And however you are comfortable, you want to meditate in a way that you can stay bright and alert but still be comfortable and relaxed. So that takes a kind of balance that we have to develop with time, practice. So beginning by turning inward to the to the inner experience of the body, first of all. So feeling your body at rest. Noticing what areas or points of sensation are particularly strong. Also noticing areas of your body where there's very little sensation, where you don't feel very much.
and having a sense of just softening and relaxing the body. So if there are any points of tension or holding, seeing if you can release those areas. And sometimes even when we can feel or be aware of the stress or tension in the body it might not be so easy to let it go. So we bring a certain amount of acceptance also to just what is present that seems a bit more stubborn, a little more stuck, it's okay. And just breathing, breathing into the body. And starting to feel the breath more specifically, feeling the breath at the nostrils or the belly, the touch and movement. It can be helpful to Start with the whole breath. So feeling the breath coming in and following it. So it fills the lungs. And going out. And then letting the attention be more narrow on a specific point of sensation in the breath. Perhaps feeling the touch of air at the nostrils coming in and out or the movement of chest or belly. Just feeling the breath can be a calming exercise. The rhythmic movement, the gentle sensations and touch. The simplicity of the breath. Nothing special. Nothing to figure out, to solve.
And naturally the mind will wander, thoughts will intrude. The simple mindfulness of breath. And first of all, try not to drift into extended daydreams, so to come back to the breath. And perhaps there's something that's troubling you, that's persistent in the mind. In that case, you might just tune into the felt experience of that disturbance. Just breathing with the feeling more than the thought itself. And we keep coming back to the breath. Just noticing if there are expectations or judgments in your mind about your meditation, seeing if you can let them go. Sometimes the mind will get quiet, comfortable. Other times we're stirred up and no amount of effort seems to interrupt that. So we just sit with that energy, the energy of disturbance. Our practice is about being present with whatever is. And while focusing on the breath can help to interrupt those disturbances, sometimes not. So to Especially try to avoid a struggle, conflict with your own mind, your own experience. So acceptance, what's arising. This tends to be the most effective strategy.
All right. Well, I hope everyone is well. I guess that's maybe a not realistic thing to hope, but I, I mean, I guess hope isn't supposed to be realistic, so I can I can go ahead and do it and not worry about it being realistic. We are um, getting ready to have our retreat in uh, just less than two weeks. I know some of you are coming. And uh, we will put information about it in the chat as the class proceeds. Um, it's a five-day retreat um, in Northern California. And uh, following the same kind of format that we've been following for many years, just mostly a silent retreat with some workshop elements. I'm just very pleased to be able to hang out with a bunch of folks and, um, you know, be live <laughs> and uh, meditate together. Um, so, um, as I mentioned, we're still working with my book, Burning Desire. And uh, we're in the section called The Higher Power of Mindfulness. And we're on page 32. Uh, this is, I read through this this morning and I was a little disappointed in that, um, the way it starts, I was hoping it was going to go into more of what it's talking about in the beginning. So I might, I might start by talking about some of that. So it says, uh, mindfulness has two components, the aspect of just being present and knowing clearly what is happening and the aspect of responding to our experience in a skillful way. Before we do anything, we need to be aware of what is really going on, not just react to stimuli in an unconscious way. The tendency of addicts and many other people is to act without clarity, without carefully exploring what is happening. This again comes out of the survival instinct that tells us we have to protect ourselves, fight or flight. Most situations though don't demand this kind of instant reaction or decision. So the first thing that mindfulness gives us is the ability to just be with our experience without running. This can be a huge challenge. Many thoughts and feelings are unpleasant and trigger our addictive reactive patterns. We just want to do something. The power to be is the courage that the spiritual path cultivates, the warrior's ability to face our demons. So, um, it then goes off into some other things, but uh, but I, I kind of wanted to to talk about what this is referring to uh, specifically, um, and and this is a this is a teaching that is I think more out of the the commentarial tradition, Buddhist tradition. It's not a not sure how often the Buddha actually referred to be these two elements of mindfulness. I th I th they are there, but uh, maybe not brought out in the same way that they are in the commentaries. In any case, when I say that it has two components, uh, these are mindfulness and clear comprehension. Uh, so, you know, the suggestion is that mindfulness itself sort of includes this other thing, clear comprehension. And, and it is, um, oh, someone wants to have the transcription enabled, absolutely. Um, so uh, mindfulness, we're kind of more aware of what that means in the, in the most sort of direct and simple way of being present with our experiences and not reacting to them in a uh, unconscious way. But clear comprehension is then uh, 
built on that clarity of seeing. And it's the thing that helps us to choose then how to respond. Uh, so one of the misunderstandings of mindfulness is that it's just a passive activity where it's just about being aware of what's happening. Oh, this is happening. This is happening. Somebody is, you know, kicking me or, you know, uh, the house is burning down, keep breathing sort of. And, and clearly that's not um, a practical way of living in the world. So this other element, clear comprehension, I think it's sama, sampajana, is the Pali. This is what uh, the wisdom that we're meant to cultivate as we practice, that we, we don't just sit there. You know, we, we start by just sitting there, you know, we're just being. But then our, our wisdom comes in, what, what should I do? And, and it is a great skill to be able to do nothing. You know, it's one of the underappreciated life skills. You know, we have that phrase of restraint of tongue and pen. You know, that's a good example of doing nothing. Um, but many times, you know, doing nothing is not a, a wise response. And, and if we take that as sort of the, the ideal, um, you know, we can, we can turn into these kind of passive uh, people that, you know, a kind of false spirituality. Um, and so wisely responding and, and, and sometimes quite, you know, assertively uh, is, is a vital part of, of our practice. So we could say this is where really mindfulness opens up into the Eightfold Path, actually. Because, you know, mindfulness is one of the elements of the Eightfold Path, but this idea of clear comprehension specifically ties mindfulness to right view. So right view is in the very generic sense, seeing the way things really are, seeing reality clearly without delusion, without denial. And specifically in the Buddhist context, it's seeing the truth of the Four Noble Truths, seeing how suffering is created, seeing how suffering ends, and seeing the cause and effect relationship in there. So mindfulness allows us to have right view. It, it's what gives us the clarity to see when suffering is arising, what's causing it, how to end it. So the, the next step of the Eightfold Path, I, I wasn't planning on giving a talk on the Eightfold Path this morning, but it looks like that's where we're going, <laughs> uh, is right intention. So again, clear comprehension needs to be there for us to have right intention. You can see how those would be naturally be tied together, that I'm, I'm mindful, but then I want to respond to this situation. What's a skillful response? Well, I need to refer to right intention, which says that all of our intentions should be founded either in letting go or cultivating loving kindness and compassion. So that, that really helps us, you know, it's very uh, uh, specific in terms of, oh, well, I'm aware of the situation and 
you know, with my mindfulness. And now I want to respond. How should I respond? Oh, how can I respond in a way that's compassionate, that doesn't reflect attachment or clinging, that isn't grasping after something, some self or ego or, or selfishness? So, uh, so there we are, you know, mindfulness is opening up this path. The next three elements of the path are about how we live, how we speak, following precepts, our livelihood. And again, we need that clarity, but they, the, the clear comprehension, but this again, really focuses the clear comprehension on, oh, I, I want to respond in a way that's skillful speech, that's not harming, that isn't breaking precepts and, and work and bring, the, bring this same attitude into my work life, my, my uh, you know, active life in the world. So that brings us to the last three elements of the Eightfold Path, right effort, right concentration, and or right mindfulness and right concentration. So obviously mindfulness is already there. The right effort, the, the perennial challenge of meditation is how do I do this, <laughs> essentially, you know, um, The teacher says, pay attention to the breath, let go of your thoughts, come back to your breath. But all this stuff is happening. How do I respond to it? Well, I want to, I need to make an effort, but I'm also told that grasping and aversion are really counter to mindfulness, to the whole idea of this path of letting go. So how am I going to make an effort that's not grasping and that's not aversive? Well, it's going to be, have to be done with clarity. <laughs> so clear comprehension is what allow, you know, has to be there in order to uh, you know, skillfully make an effort. And, and clear comprehension also kind of gives, mindfulness will give me the feedback on the effort. But when I make effort, there'll be some result. It'll either be that, oh, that, that moved me into a more, you know, clear and calm space, or, oh, that stirred up more. Now I'm struggling. So that's the mindfulness letting me know that my effort is either in balance or out of balance. The, the clarity then says, okay, how do I respond to that feedback that I got from the mindfulness? Yeah. And so, uh, you know, finally, you know, the, the, the last element of the Eightfold Path is, is concentration. And when Mindfulness and clear comprehension kind of uh, blend together and come into flow so that we are very present and aware and we are skillfully navigating our moment to moment experience with all these other elements of the path, with our right view, with our right attention, with our right effort then concentration, or calm, samadhi naturally arises. It's not something we have to sort of gin up. You know, we don't have to dig around trying to make concentration happen. It's rather that we, we come into this natural flow and natural connection, and then the calming and clarity just deepens uh, through that process. So uh, I... I, I, just to come back to kind of the starting point, I think it's very important to understand that our meditation is not meant to be a passive activity. It, it appears to be passive, but 
in order for it to really be fulfill its purpose, we need to be engaged with clear comprehension. And it's, you know, it's again a perennial challenge uh, because our natural tendencies, our conditioning, lead us to grasping, you know, to greed, hatred, and delusion, you know, to grasping, to pushing away, to to uh, shutting down. And so those are the opposite of clear comprehension. And they are also delusion, particularly is feeding us inaccurate information, <laughs> right? Your mind, you know, is not always trustworthy. So uh, an important part of this, of mindfulness and clear comprehension is just determining whether in this moment, what's coming out of my mind is useful, accurate information, or whether it is delusion, or whether it is ego, whether it is ignorance, whether it is grasping, you know. And so part of our practice, significant part of our practice is starting to become attuned to the way those different things, those two different things feel, how it feels to be clear and present versus how it feels to be caught up in my stuff. And then not only do we need to be aware of that, then we need to have the willingness to do the next right thing. Because the, the power of our conditioning, even when we know, like, oh yeah, this is kind of, I'm driven by this energy, this, I'm really being carried by this energy, it's, it's still difficult to turn away from it, right? That's why it's hard to stop drinking when, even when you realize you're an alcoholic, uh, because it's a very powerful force, that addiction. And our, our mind is kind of a, uh, our minds are addictive in, in some very essential way. That, that is, we are very attached to the things that, that uh, have conditioned us or the conditioning, to our conditioning. We're very attached to our conditioning, which is almost, is essentially a redundancy because our conditioning is our attachment. But it also does point to something real, which is that it's possible to detach from your conditioning. And this is like a lot of our daily struggle, I would say. I think it's a lot of my own daily struggle it is you know, can I let go in this moment? You know, can I let go in this moment? What, what am I clinging to in this moment? Is this, you know, helpful? Is this, am I just playing out that conditioning once again? So, um, I, I want to, because I'm trying to work through this book, <laughs> I want to, in some way, I don't know, uh, th th this is section of the book is useful, and it's mostly about working with pain. So I, I don't know, I don't think I'm going to um, go into it right now. Maybe I'll bring, go, come back to this on Friday, um, uh, because this is a, a whole teaching on working with pain in the body, in meditation. Um, so I will, um, I think I'll let that go for now and just open this up today because it seems like I don't want to give two separate Dharma talks. <laughs> um, 
and uh and it seems like i just gave a gave one so uh, i'll uh, invite people to participate now thank you uh kevin um we had a question about um are we have are you going to be at a retreat center in wisconsin in the summer I'm going to be at a uh, substance use disorder conference uh, in September, uh, September 22nd and 23rd. And then that's a Thursday and Friday. And then I'm going to go over to uh, Minneapolis. Uh, I think I'm, we haven't confirmed, but I believe I'm going to be doing like a half day workshop in Minneapolis on the 25th. That'll be a Sunday in September. Thank you for asking. <laughs> Steve, did you have your virtual hand up? I have my virtual hand up, yes. <clears throat> I have a, a question. It's, um, I'm very curious because um, this has always been a real challenge for me, this concept of higher power and God and everything. And I just enjoyed reading this book. And my question is, Kevin, and, um, the, the more I study and the more I read the Dhammapada, um, I, I'm trying to get some sort of a, is there a, a sequential event? I mean, when the Buddha's teachings, it seems to me that the first thing that came up, obviously, in his, in his awakening was the Four Noble Truths, which led to the Eightfold Path. And then as I read the Dhammapada, I mean, it doesn't seem like anything's linear, but at the same time, the more I read it and the more I study it, which I'm spending most of my time with the Four Noble Truths and the Eightfold Path, how it relates to my higher power. Uh, I think the first thing that came up that the Buddha tried to teach was the, um, the idea of diligence. And so all these teachings and all these writings, there's so many of them. Yeah. I mean, it's like, what started first and how did it come along? I mean, where, where does the Dhammapada fit in in terms of a sequence after the Four Noble Truths was brought out in the Eightfold Path? And then how does that lead into understanding my concept of higher power, which is the Dharma? So, I mean, that's a multifold question, but uh, yeah. I can't figure it out. <laughs> well, first of all, just in, in, in terms of thinking about this in some kind of historical way, you can't think of the different teachings as like, oh, the Buddha wrote this book, and then later he wrote this book, you know, and then right. uh, his publisher said, why don't you do something on, uh, you know, loving kindness. And it's, you know, we have these teachings that are collected and the Dhammapada, as I understand it, is one of the earlier collections. Okay. So things got collected in different ways and, um, at, at, and at different times. And of course, nothing, in, maybe not of course, nothing was written down at the time of the Buddha or in the immediate aftermath of his life. So everything was just uh, orally transmitted people. That's how the whole chanting tradition came about. So all this stuff was chanted for a couple hundred years until they started to scratch it onto ola leaves in Sri Lanka. So uh, there's no real answer to that question. It's more, it's more that later teachers, commentaries have gone back and tried to systematize what the Buddha taught and kind of put it into a structure. What we understand about his approach is that he would be in a particular situation with particular people and he would intuit <laughs> what those individuals needed to hear what they were ready to hear what was going to be most helpful for them and then he would give a teaching for them so he could be going around you know from one day to the next giving very different teachings because if he's teaching to lay people it's one offering when it's to monastics it's another offering if it's young monastics it's one offering when it, if it's you know, very experienced monastics, it's another offering. So it, it's really um, just this very diverse range of, of uh, approaches and, and kind of voices that he's speaking from. So uh, it's our, our kind of position then is to try to 
make some global sense out of what the Buddha taught. And, and that's why starting with the Four Noble Truths and the Eightfold Path is so effective because you can build many of the branches of his teachings off of those. And, and I, you know, I think of these as kind of, you know, you got the, the Four Noble Truths and then the, the Eightfold Path branches off from the Fourth Noble Truth. And then each of the elements of the Eightfold Path has branches, that is the, the subcategories of each of those. And once you get done with that, you've covered like a lot of what you need to know. Once you understand that, then you can kind of take um, the, uh, the Brahma Viharas, loving kindness, compassion, sympathetic joy, and equanimity, and kind of make another package, <laughs> you know, another uh, br branch over here and work with that. Uh, I mean, that ties in really most directly with the first noble truth, the, the truth of suffering, right? Because the, it's, the, the Brahma Viharas are really an antidote to the, the, to suffering. Uh, but then, you know, the other teachings that you might sort of want to get into tend to be, you know, you can find the connections then. You've, you've got kind of the basic framework. And yeah, there are some things like, oh, the five hindrances, where, where do they fit in? Well, you can find it, you know, oh, well, they're really, they cause suffering. So really they fall under the second note noble truth, et cetera. You know, everything starts to kind of uh, come in uh, under those, uh, that umbrella. Yeah. That's extremely helpful because unlike the 12 step program, you can't obviously st do steps seven, eight, nine, and 10 without going through the first three, four, one, two, three, four, five. It's very structured, but th that makes a lot of sense because there is some structure to it, but it's kind of more broad based. So, you know, thank yeah. you. That, that's a great explanation. It really helps me a lot. Thank you. Yeah, it was a really good question. And uh, I, I like it when you when you bring a question like that forward that just kind of let's let's make some sense out of this, uh, because it is it can be very difficult to, to pick up one Buddhist text and try to understand it in the larger context, you know, yeah. Catherine T, hello, nice to see you. Hi there, greetings from Bucks County, Pennsylvania. <laughs> oh, my old stomping ground, yes, uh -huh. New Hope and uh, yeah. I've missed you all, I've um, been you know, traveling here and then I'm spending time here with family and first time sober, you know, around everything and everybody, you know. Uh -huh in the pandemic, but it's beautiful. It's green. The trees are starting to come to life, but um, yeah. I've been sticking with my practice, you know, as much as I can daily still, but um, what I'm noticing a lot in meditation, I noticed it today is that like my felt sense is so heightened um, just with all types of stuff and anxiety and some of the things I'm dealing with, like with in my family unit and a lot of stressors. Um, so when I was meditating, you said that the thoughts like, distract you then like go to the felt sense but my felt sense is so like it's like the energy is so like heightened so i just wonder if you have any um, tips or thoughts on how to like work with the extreme felt sense mm -hmm. yeah that's great thank you Catherine. and you know having just spent uh some time traveling and with my family i mean first of all and i'll put aside the family part just just being out of routine, I think makes, for me, really makes meditation a lot harder. And I, and I, you know, you think, oh, I'm on vacation, I have more time to meditate, but it actually works the opposite. It's like, somehow, like everything gets filled up in the day, and everybody's expecting you to do things. And, you know, so, so I generally find it harder to meditate when I'm out of my routine. And certainly with family, then, uh, uh, the additional triggers. <laughs> yeah, so so uh, it's a good question, you know, and I, I, I don't have an, I don't want to give you an answer because I'm not sure there is a specific answer that, that maybe sometimes it's not best to go to the felt sense if it's, as you're talking about, sort of like, whoa, like, this isn't really 
containable. I'm just not really able to hold this right now. Maybe I need to just try to concentrate, you know, on the, maybe I'll just count my breaths or do something very uh, structured and uh, dry, just like sort of, you know, you know, I, I don't know. Not not a great term for meditation, but kind of force it a little bit, trying, you know, a little bit more efforting on the concentration to just like, let me just, you know, focus. The but but the other the other um, sort of approach, and, and this is more of a felt experience and and more i guess uh uh creative in a way sort of using the imagination is just seeing if you can sense your mind and i guess body as a larger space so so that there's room for all that energy to just be there you know and it's just like oh just let it you know, and, and so, so the reasoning behind this is that that, that sense of uh, overwhelm, I think gets kind of claustrophobic because we're, it's like, we're trying to hold it down or we're trying to hold it, you know, it's like, Oh, I got to contain this, you know? And if I, if I just think of it as energy that just needs more room, then maybe I can breathe with that and, and staying with the breath very much, you know, like, and, and can I just let it come through as energy um, rather than trying to hold on to it? You know, and again, it's just kind of perspective and sort of using the imagination to, to, to sort of um, re kind of recast our viewpoint of what we're of what we're experiencing. I, I mean, it's just it's which is very much an acknowledgement that the problem is still very much in our own mind. You know that this isn't manageable. It doesn't feel manageable. And if I if I say, well, you know, maybe it is manageable or, or maybe I don't have to manage it. You know, maybe it can manage itself if I just let it, let it out of its cage. Uh, you know, so I, I would, I would look at those two different approaches and just see, you know, in the moment, see what's, what seems to be effective. And, and maybe it's not a good time to meditate, you know? Yeah, it's interesting. I was thinking that, like, oh, I guess this is my thing. But it's like, oh, you know, what? I'm not going to give myself a hard time for not being going to do my 45 minutes. Like, how about no, five? You know, exactly. So, so helpful. Yeah. Thank you for that. And like, just to not let my skin be the boundary between me yeah. and my energy. And uh, yeah, and I try let me loving kindness as a concentration. Perhaps. Yeah. Um, yeah. Cool. Yeah. Thank you so much. That really is super helpful. So well, and don't drink or use, no matter what. Bottom line, you know. Because everything else will be okay. Your meditation will be fine. You know? Thank you so much. Thanks, Catherine. Enjoy Bucks County. Lovely area. Hi, Dana. Hey, Kevin. How are you? I'm pretty good. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, I just wanted to share. I just had a um, recent new experience, which kind of speaks to, I think, what you were speaking about. Um, and I have a very busy mind and anxious um, body. And so I went and did a salt float. I don't know if you've heard of this, where you're mm -hmm. basically in a sensory deprivation pod floating in 10 inches of salt water. Your body mm -hmm. will just float. Mm -hmm. You have the option of music or lights or darkness. Um, and, you know, first time in, I just went, went, went for it and did complete darkness and just did, you know, the little five minutes of music at the beginning and the end, just a signal. And it was an hour. Mm -hmm. And so like, I just used mindfulness and just kept concentrating on my breath, but there's so much happening that I don't know, like 
what am I supposed to be experiencing? And I'm like, oh no, don't hold on to it. Whatever, if it's, you know, if I'm seeing things or hearing things, I just, there was a lot going on, even though there was nothing going on, right? <laughs> and then, yeah, there's this sense of the floating, just the body, it just kind of disappeared and mm -hmm. I disappeared. I think I fell asleep, <laughs> but it was, it was good. I mean, I had effects the day that night and the next day, which was yesterday, I did it Sunday. So I just didn't know if you had experience with that or any advice for me knowing me and how what the things I do tend to cling to and that I do have a very curious and creative mind so my, I want to go there you know and go somewhere you know <laughs> else instead of just staying and counting breaths um, which I did kept I just kept coming back and counting so that I just wanted to share and see if you had any feedback. Mm. I don't have any experience with that it's always sounded very interesting um, you know, my, my understanding is it, it's meant to be very relaxing, right? That it's meant to sort of, uh, and it, it just allow you to, to get very quiet. But, but for those of us who don't, <laughs> whose minds don't tend toward that, it seems like it can go the other way a little bit. And that's the risk in it. Uh, I don't know. It, isn't that something that um, the um, oh, anyway? There was a, wasn't there a movie about this, like about the sensory deprivation units? I don't know. Anyway, um, I, I really don't have much for you, Dana, because I don't really. I haven't experienced it, you know. Um, it does just sound like a time to practice, you know, mindfulness and concentration. And it seems like a good opportunity for that. But, um, you know, if it, it could also, you know, get very busy in the mind, uh, just because uh, there's nothing happening. And as as often seems to happen. Thank you. And it did relax me. So I did get benefit from it. But, you know, towards the end, I was like, what if I get electrocuted? This is water and electricity. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> no, exactly. Like the mind starts to look for problems, you know, yeah. just like, uh, so, yeah, I mean, I don't like to say that addicts are like different from other people, but in some ways we might be different from other people. I don't know. Um, so uh, I think we're gonna close it down. I think it seems that all of us come outside. So to greet us, um, I'm just looking at through the chat to see if there's anything I need to respond to there. Kevin, there is a question about loving kindness as part of a trio. Oh. You, you, excuse me, I, that was my question. I, when you That's were right. talking about uh, the Four Noble Truths and the Eightfold Path and the subsets of other branches that come off, I thought uh -huh. you referred to a trio or perhaps a duo of elements that include loving kindness by a poly name. And, I, I didn't get it fast enough to write it down, so I can look it up later. Oh, I guess I said Brahma Viharas. Is that what yes. you're? Yes. Yes. So Brahma, like Brahma, B R A H M A, and Vihara is V I H A R A. And sometimes it's shown as one word, sometimes two words, but it means sort of ab abode of the gods. Um, yeah, and that's what the four. Uh, the loving kindness, compassion, sympathetic joy, and equanimity are. Thank you and so much. I could give a talk on that. <laughs> Maybe I'll give a talk on that this week since there's interest. I, I see someone asking about, will any of your European tour be on Zoom? <laughs> uh, I'm not 
going on a European tour. I'm going to be in Ireland and stopping in London for a day long retreat. Pretty sure that the London retreat will not be on Zoom, but I'm planning that my Tuesday morning class, like there'll be just a few, I mean, it's going to be like three weeks. I think that I'll be able to do most of the Tuesday mornings because that'll be evening over there. Friday night, uh, I'm going to have to get some people to fill in. We have our ABLE crew to do that. So, um, but uh, let's not get ahead of ourselves. <laughs> it's in July. Um, so thank you all for showing up and, uh, and for some great questions. It was really good conversation with you guys this morning. And uh, see you on Friday night.